We used to think that in the future we'd all be zooming around in flying cars that run on flowers and smiles. Well, this is the future and oil is still the lifeblood of the modern world. <clears throat> The world's roads are packed with 800 million greedy vehicles guzzling their way through 7 billion litres of petrol. Keeping the fuel lines flowing safely with this flammable liquid demands a potent mix of engineering brilliance, chemical wizardry and mucky manual labour. So, how do they do it? Texas. USA. From the look of this hot, barren, windswept landscape, you'd be forgiven for assuming this area must be a rural backwater. But in fact, this is one of the richest spots in the world, because Texas is home to the American oil industry. been drilling for oil here since 1894. But it wasn't until 1901 that the oil boom really took off, when at a stroke, the Lucas Gusher tripled US oil production. Since then, almost 60 billion barrels have been pumped out from the Texan soil. And if the oil companies have got their sums right, there are reserves of another 10 billion barrels or so still to be extracted. The sticky, smelly black liquid thereafter is crude oil, which is the raw material needed for making petrol. It was formed from the remains of tiny sea plants and animals during the Permian period. Thanks to the action of heat and pressure, 250 million years later, they've been transformed into one of the world's most vital energy sources. This is black gold, Texas tea, the best there is. It smells like rotten eggs, but it also smells like money. On this hot, sticky Texas morning, the crew of Derrick Rig 62 are setting to work sinking a new well. Every month, more than a thousand new wells are drilled here in Texas, and together they pump out over 900,000 barrels of crude every day. To keep that oil flowing, producers like Occidental Petroleum will sink more than a hundred wells a year. So for guys like Rick Baker, this hot, noisy, back-breaking work is very much just another day at the office. I love this job a lot, you know. I've been, uh, been doing it for 11 years. We take pride on our work. It's like a big family out here on this rig right here. But the team face an arduous task, getting the oil out. In this area, known as the Permian Basin, the crude lies up to two miles down, trapped in rocks over 250 million years old. To reach it, they use the Derrick's huge motors to grind a diamond-tipped drill bit deep into the earth. But all the friction creates huge amounts of heat so high-pressure drilling fluid is pumped down a pipe to cool the cutting head. The fluid then carries the cuttings back to the surface where they're left to settle out in mud pits. It's noisy, dangerous work. Rick needs to keep the pressure on the drill bit just right. Too little and it won't cut. Too much and it will fracture. What's more, he must constantly be on guard for the threat of gas releases, which could cause catastrophic explosions. Working on a drilling rig is real dangerous. Uh, he had to be uh, pretty well tough to be out there doing this kind of work. As they drill, the team need to regularly attach new nine-meter lengths of drilling pipe using an enormous five-ton automated wrench called an iron roughneck. With the drill head burrowing at around five meters an hour, this arduous task must be repeated every couple of hours, 24 hours a day. The drilling only intermittently halted to line the well. Eventually, if they're lucky, they strike oil. 
Initially, the pressure of the trapped oil forces it through small holes in the finished pipe and up to the surface. But this natural pressure doesn't last forever. So to keep the crude flowing, they use one of these. This is called a pumping jack, or nodding donkey. The circular motion of the powered flywheel is converted into vertical motion and, like an enormous metal syringe, it sucks the oil to the surface. Dotted across the empty plains, these quietly insistent nodding donkeys harvest the black gold of Texas. But these oil fields are many miles from where the crude oil is needed. So a series of pumps feed it to a pipeline and off on a 500-mile journey to the other side of the state. This extraordinary citadel of gleaming silver pipework is Baytown. Less than 30 miles from Houston, it looks like something out of Blade Runner and is the single largest oil refinery in the whole of the US. With over 5,000 miles of metal piping spread across 2,400 acres, this place can refine 560,000 barrels of crude oil every day. Not only does it get incredibly hot here, the noise is so deafening, its 4,000 strong workforce get through over a million ear protectors every year. This place is so huge, as well as Texan crude oil, it also sucks in supplies from all around the world. To satisfy Baytown's thirst, vast 300-meter-long tankers arrive at the specially constructed docks. Over 20 of these massive vessels arrive every month, each one delivering up to 3 million barrels from their huge holds. As much oil as every well in Texas produces in three and a half days. The thing about crude oil is, it's crude. Even if you could get that stuff into your petrol tank and somehow set fire to it, it wouldn't provide the instant explosive power that internal combustion craves. To be honest, you'd be better off coating your driveway with it than driving with it. To become usable fuel, it has to be refined. So at the heart of the refinery lies the laboratory, headed by Joyce Bussey. It's up to Joyce's lab to supervise the process of turning the crude oil into usable products. Crude oil in this state is not very useful at all. If you put this in your tank, you'd be sorry, because it wouldn't go anywhere. The trouble with crude oil is it contains a mix of hydrocarbons, each of which has a different number of carbon atoms. The hydrocarbons are different in weight. The lightest is propane, while the heaviest is used to make asphalt. Extracting petrol from this mix is a formidable challenge, and it requires one heck of a chemistry set to do it. The most important part of the plant is this. Like a moonshine still as tall as a cathedral, this is where the crude is separated. Heated to over 370 degrees Celsius, it's pumped into the base of the tower. And like steam from a kettle, the vapor rises. As it cools, the molecules condense. The heavy asphalt and tar at the bottom, while lighter molecules, including diesel, jet fuel and petrol, continue rising until they too condense and can be siphoned off. But the trouble with producing all this fuel is they now have an ocean of potentially explosive liquid to deal with. But of course, it's this explosive quality that makes petrol so useful. So to make sure it's as explosive as it should be, it's up to workers like Derek Smalley to carefully take samples for analysis in the lab. In all, every 159-litre barrel of crude produces 73 litres of petrol, 
35 litres of diesel, around 20 litres of jet fuel and heavy fuel oil, almost 6 litres of propane and another 34 litres of other products such as butane, asphalt and sulphur. Every day this plant produces enough petrol to fuel a car on 770 round trips to the moon. Unless, of course, you drive a 4x4, in which case you may have to fill up halfway. Anyway, Derek delivers his samples to the lab for testing. Our lab does the final product check of all product that goes out of the, the refinery. And if it doesn't meet our customer's expectation, it doesn't go out the gate. The fuel is tested by feeding it to a petrol connoisseur an aging but robust knock testing engine. Engine knocking happens when fuel spontaneously ignites as it's being compressed in the engine cylinder. The reason for this premature ignition is there's too much heptane and not enough octane in the mix. By increasing the percentage of octane, the mix can be improved until the knocking stops. The lab can then feed their data back into the main refinery to correct any mixing errors and ensure a perfect blend. With the refinery's work done, some of her half a million valves are opened and the petrol flows through underground pipelines which feed it to various local terminals like this one in South Houston. From here, it's transferred to huge tankers for delivery by drivers like Bradley Unruh. But filling up a tanker is way more dangerous than simply filling up your car. It can be dangerous, but just being a good, cautious, alert driver really, really, really helps. The hundreds of litres of volatile cargo mean it's essential Bradley follows stringent safety procedures. A mistake while loading or unloading the tank could result in a serious explosion, so he takes no chances. The metal bodywork can generate sparks from static electricity, so first a cord is attached to ground the trailer and also activate the overfill protection probes at the top of each compartment. To cope with the threat of highly flammable vapours escaping, a second pipe, known as the vapour recovery pipe, siphons off any leaks, which might otherwise escape into the atmosphere. Only once these are in place can Bradley connect the fuel lines and begin to pump. Every day, over 4 million litres of petrol are safely transported to local gas stations from this terminal alone. Pumped into the service station's huge reservoir, the petrol is finally ready for use. So you can at least find solace in the extraordinary work it's taken to keep your wheels turning the next time you fill up your car and grimace at the cost of your fuel. But until your futuristic flower-powered flying car comes along, you just have to grin and bear it. Coming up, 